So today we're going to be looking at the new cards and the patch notes for 10.2. We'll start with the patch notes. If you want to go to the new cards, just see that reaction. I will have a chapter for that down below. But let's start off with the neutrals. So all god from 4 to 5, provisions from 9 to 10. And we have a new part of the ability here. Increase the number of targets by one for each offering in your starting deck. So all gods, three targets now. This could go up to five if you have two offerings. Five point or five targets for carryover is much better. And that's actually quite a bit of carryover then. So what, like 10 points of carryover? That's pretty good. So that is pretty good. We'll see if the offering... I see offering got changed here. I don't know what it got changed to. But if it's anything decent, this could see quite a bit of play. Let's take a look at what offering does then. So provision costs from 6 to 5. Ability change to destroy a unit with 4 power or less. Then boost an allied unit in your deck by 2. Okay, so this is very interesting. So it's a control card. You don't want to, offering used to be like damage a unit by one, and if it killed it, you summon a bronze from your graveyard. I believe what it was. This is much better. So for five provisions, you have a destroy four or less. Um, this kind of uh, this counters spotter because spotter's a four with a bunch of armor. Not that spotter has been as prevalent this patch as after they reworked it. Well, immediately after they reworked it. So this is potentially very good. You can destroy stuff with shields, so Hefty Helga get, dies to this. Um, stuff with Veil doesn't matter. Like this, Veil protection usually protects against lock. This will destroy. But yeah, this, this the, basically the big thing of this one is it goes around armor and it goes around shield. So that's quite nice. Kind of like Attorney Joust with the shield part. And then you boost an allied unit in your deck by two. So I quite like this card. The only thing is a lot of four power engines have been turning to five power engines lately. But for 5, you destroy a 4 power or less and boost the unit in your deck by 2. The boost the unit in your deck by 2 is really the thing you want to be happening here. If you're not destroying with a 4, you can't. it's not like you have a 4 damage card, you hit a 5 power engine, and it doesn't die, but you still got 4 value. This just can't be played. Although, the other thing with this is you can use it on Death Wish cards, right? So if you're playing a Death Wish deck, you can destroy your own card with this. And then you'll get the Death Wish effect and boost in your deck. So that's an interesting application here that we'll have to take a look at as well. But overall, the All God and Offering combo, it looks pretty good. You can get a lot of deck carryover. See so what? You could get five targets from All God, then two from Offering. Assuming you're not making any more. So that's quite a bit of deck carryover and maybe enough to see hand buff getting some play. Um, this is more like a deck buff, but it's the same concept. Yeah, this looks really interesting. We'll be trying that out for sure. And here we go, Renfrey again. There have been so many changes to Renfrey that, um, whatever. Let's take a look. Blessing of Kindness. The first time you play a unit on your side of the battle for each turn, it's odd power boost by, yeah, we have this effect here getting changed. So what happened was sometimes you just play a whole bunch of units and then the Blessing of Kindness was insane. So I guess they're getting rid of that and <laughs> making this a little bit worse. And then we have Renfrey Curse of Sloth. This is the one everyone plays now. Play a bronze unit from your hand. Look at the top three units from your deck and draw ones. Yeah. So every time they nerf one of the Renfrey abilities, people just start picking a different one. And that one becomes the best. Everyone chooses that one. We'll see what it is this time. Uh, Curse of Sloth was too much consistency. Like you play your Renfrey, then oh, look, I don't care if I didn't draw my Meteor Shower. I have her now. So this one probably deserved to be nerfed, but... We'll see how much Renfrey we stay, see, especially with some of these new cards. In particular, the Nilfgaard one might have some synergies with her. Next up, we have Doppler. So, power from 1 to 2. Yeah, Doppler's been power crept. I used to like Doppler. Deploy melee. Choose a unit in your hand. Boost self a number of units in your hand of the same primary category. I'm assuming this counts the same card. So, like, if we had one dragon and we picked a dragon, we'd get plus one point. So potentially then, you could get some good value from Doppler then. You already could, but it's hard to have all the same units. You're playing something like Dwarves maybe, because they don't play many specials, so you mostly just have Dwarf units in your hand. The base power too, this could be pretty decent. So if you what, have 7 units in your hand, which isn't too unreasonable, you'd get a 9. That's not bad at all actually. We have range, boost one cell phone for each unique category among the units in your hand. Um, maybe for like something like if you're playing a deck like Harmony, it plays a lot of different units. You wouldn't play this in Harmony because it's not a Squatel card. 
but something like that. I think the melee effect's still much better, but maybe we'll see Doppler. I kind of suspect, are there any unit decks that just spam units? I mean, like Renfrey. Does this become a Renfrey card? Let's see, Renfrey Nilfgaard is like, what, 95% humans? Maybe you play this in there as one of your, instead of like the spotter slots or something. Maybe you do. That would be interesting. We'll see. But uh, Doppler change is definitely better. Now moving on to the monsters change. We only have one change here, and it's Ruin. Power from 4 to 3. Okay. Ability change to Death Wish. Summon self from graveyard to your melee row. Okay. It's really nice that it goes to the melee row. One of the most annoying things about Ruin was it went to a random row, and a lot of time you're relying on Slizzard to consume it. And then it was in the wrong row, and it couldn't use it. <laughs> and then consume your lowest power unit, excluding self. So he comes back... And then also consume something. You've got a lot of low power, a lot of low power Death Wish cards like the Siren, like the Night Wraith, that type of stuff. Then it's pretty nice. Or Harpy Egg, as it'll come back from the graveyard when it's, you consume it, it comes back. Then consume something else, and you can still consume the Ruin again, right? And keep the points. So it comes back. It consumes a four, and it goes to seven. You can just consume it still. You'll keep those seven points on something else, and then your Ruin will trigger again. Uh, the only danger with this is if you have not many units and your ruin just becomes like the only unit on your field and it's super tall. But I think this is a decent change. So we'll see how this works out. It should be kind of fun to play around with at least. Skellige, uh Drag is getting a change here. So this is the guy who uh, boosts all warriors by one, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's what he is. So power change from four to five. Okay. Deploy, move a bronze warrior from your deck to the graveyard. Uh, that is, so it thins your deck by one, and you can do, Skirmishers don't trigger from the deck, and Morkvarg is not a warrior. Okay, so we don't trigger him. It just moves, it just thins your deck by one. Zeal order, trigger the veteran of an allied unit in your graveyard. Okay, cool down one. So potentially what you do here is you, like, put your tier six Skirmisher, not Skirmisher, um, what's the, 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 the one that gets that's just veteran with veil you put that in your graveyard and then every turn for a few turns you boost up the veteran so it's like a 10 and then you can bring it back with like war plans or something or something really big that's interesting i think the thinning aspect here is really nice and i don't know it's interesting definitely interesting we'll see how it combos with this other change in the new cards but i think this could be good Svangri has power from six to three okay so he's a 3 for 8 now. The ability to boost self by the base power. Last skill you that went into your graveyard this round. So you're going to use this with either your Yudda or your um, Greatsword, depending. Probably Yudda and Blaze of Glory. So if you Blaze of Glory and you send Yudda, this becomes a 15 for 8. That's pretty good. <laughs> that is pretty good. Uh, if you don't use Yudda, and say the opponent just, like, kills your Bear Witcher or something, it's still an 11. That's not great. It's all right, though. So, yeah, I think you combo this with Yudda, and you can combo it with Dreg if you want to, because he was a Bronze Warrior. That can be a great sword. You can move a great sword with this, and then you can play this for 13. That's still pretty good. Very interesting change. Um, I think more of this graveyard-centric warrior stuff's pretty cool. Ever since they removed Iced as the leader, the second wind, there hasn't they like added Bakusha and Sir his right was already in the game. So more of this graveyard centric stuff I think is interesting for Skellige. Next up we have Northern Rounds with Griffin, which are mentor. So ability change to deploy, draw your top unit and boost it by one, and then shuffle a card from your hand back into your deck. Okay, so it's very similar. You're drawing the one, you're giving it a boost, you're putting it back in the deck. Uh, you're giving a one boost. It used to be no boost. You know what they generally I believe. Adrenaline 4, draw your top two units and boost them by one. So you're getting an extra card here and shuffling two back into your deck. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Traveling Precess works really well with this. That type of stuff gives you more consistency. And overall, I think it's a pretty good change. Because the only time you saw Griffin and Witcher Mentor was that, that patch or two where Traveling Priestess was ridiculous. And that was the only time you ever saw it. So I'm glad to see a little change here. Square Tail, no changes. To be fair, there's a lot of decent Square Tail decks right now, so... I guess, but there's still some bronzes that could be buffed at some point. But I guess I'll do that not in a card drop patch like usual. So, Nilfgaard Imposter. All right, here we go. Imposter gets a new part of the ability. Whenever you play an aristocrat on your side of the battlefield, there are four different statuses on your opponent's side. 
boost it by one. So we have passive effect here. Is, is this enough? I guess we want this to be the Masquerade Ball Aristocrat deck instead of Imprisonment, but Imprisonment gives you those statuses with the uh, leader charges. It's certainly interesting. I'm sure we'll experiment with it. Imprisonment is just so incredibly flexible. It's like a it's like a safety net, right? You don't have to play locks or control in your deck because you always have the imprisonment there to take care of it for you. So we'll see if you can actually make this work. But aristocrats do have poisons, which is a nice control tool for big stuff. So maybe this will be good enough. We'll see. And here we go. We're gonna see. Let's let's see the the slew of changes to Nilfgaard, because as always, Nilfgaard's like the only deck you play on the ladder. So Yame, we have change of power from six to two okay what else ability changed boost self by the number of allied knights on this row then boost self and enemy unit by half their combined power so you can still play this without any knights because you'll play this with himself right like you just play it with himself he's a knight you do you play him he goes from two to three then he boosts self in an enemy by half their combined power so essentially what this does is it's a nerf of like two points to the boost then two points on the ivar if you're not playing a knight deck if you're playing a knight deck well then you can get this big boost back i really like this i think one of the things with yame all these cards that just form these little three card packages and then you play them in every deck i i really hate it when you people do that it's it just shows the cards are too strong and they don't fit in their archetype. And their archetype's too weak or something. So I'm glad we saw this change to Guillaume. He's like every single Nilfgaard deck, basically. We have Ivar Evil Eye Power from 4 to 5, which is a nerf. It's always funny to say Ivar getting a nerf when he gets boosted. Yes, yeah, so the reason this is a nerf because when you swap power, the opponent gets an extra point. So that's worth noting. <laughs> so this is a nerf to Ivar. Um, yeah, so that's warranted as well. Like... By the way, guys, remember when Ivar came out and everyone said it was garbage? I told people Ivar would be OP at some point. It looks like I was right, because at some point they'd add something that made Ivar super good. <laughs> so uh, it looks like that was correct. And now we're here nerfing him. Just to point out, like, in, in games like this, even cards that are super weak, if they have a unique effect, at some point they'll probably be exploited. Next up we have Milton, 6 to 7. Yep, second nerf, change to Milton, another nerf. War warranted, again. Palmerin, though, from 8 to 7, he got buffed. So if you're playing the Milton and Palmerin combo like they want you to, then it's the same amount of provisions. If you're just playing Milton and Guillaume, then it's nerfed. So again, they want to make it more incorporated into the Knight deck. They want to be playing both of these. That's fine. Then we have Tibor from 13 to 12 provisions. Okay, so... On the face of it, this is a buff. However, now you can't be as consistent with your Ehorax Tibor combo, which is very fun. It's a, so, uh, <laughs> can't make any 12 version cards in that deck now, or 12 version units in that deck. Uh, I don't think I played any though, so I think it's fine. But yeah, this is a nice that Tibor got a buff. Spotter from four to three, another spotter nerf. Tell me if you're surprised, because I'm not. And then Tunnel Drill. Oh, is Tunnel Drill finally dead? Tunnel Drill. Ability change to Profit 2. Okay. Fee 2. Damage enemy by 3. So that's really good. Cooldown 1. Ah, uh, there it is. We've finally dealt with Tunnel Drill. This card is... I wouldn't say... How do I put this? I wouldn't say Tunnel Drill has been, like, the strongest card in the game for a long... forever, but Tunnel Drill has one of the most problematic cards for design wise in the game for a long time because you have to keep doing stuff around tunnel drill like if tunnel drill lives you lose basically so now it's just an engine card that does good damage we play a crime reduce cooldown by one so no more Siege tunnel drill minus every unit on your board now you can Siege tunnel drill and do three damage I think this is deserved, but I also think Tunnel Drill is completely dead. So, we'll see. 
Uh, the ability to do six in a turn is fine if you cool down it. So maybe you can still see playing crime heavy decks, which is what you'd want, I think. But it's not going to be in all those syndicate decks anymore. This nerfs the Seagy deck and it nerfs the uh, somewhat the Golden Necker deck because sometimes the Golden Necker deck just pulls Tunnel Drill and you lose. Feels bad. But yeah, this just seems to make sense. So those are the changes. Uh, overall, makes sense. I quite like most of them. And let's get on to taking a look at the new cards. Alright, as far as the new cards go, let's start off with Scoia'tael here. Two new cards per faction. Let's take a look. I had to go to the Gwent Reddit here to find the pictures because, once again, we do not have the new cards on the Gwent website yet. The official play Gwent, as far as I can tell. Would be really nice if they were there, so I don't have to read all these people complaining on Reddit, because apparently that's all people do on Reddit. Anyway, we have Quaxrenix, probably pronounced that wrong, I apologize, Relict, Harmony, okay, Harmony's pretty good now, but I won't complain about new Harmony cards, we've got a 5 power, 13 provision unit, whenever you play another Relict, spawn and play Lock Fan Convergence. Now that's very interesting, so it's pretty good. Each time you play a relic, you spawn a special card that creates a unit. So that's pretty good. The other relics, there's not many relics. You have Dana, you have uh, Johnny and Sarah, then you have Kyronax, Ihorax, and um, Unicorn. I think there's probably a couple more. Like All God is one too. There's a few more. But this really helps if you want to make a relic deck. Because each time you play them, they'll create the convergence. And the nice thing is Johnny and Sarah in particular synergize quite well with special cards. So it's very interesting. The only thing here is that this is a 13 provision, 5 power engine unit, you ha engine card you have to have live. And I find that somewhat unlikely. So... If you're playing this, you have to play Fegus, I think. You have to Defender this. But if you do Defender it and it stays alive, there is a lot of potential value here. So it's very interesting. It's an interesting card. The thing to point out, I just mentioned it's a 5 power. The other Relics, a lot of them, well, several of them at least, at least all got. They have ways to boost your other cards. Sarah can boost stuff on the board. And if you're playing All God, you can use the Offering too. So there's other ways to boost this. Wasn't die immediately, and you're in Scoia'tael, so you protection stuff like you'd use Girl Tactics on it, stuff like that. So there's ways to keep it alive, and if it keeps stays alive, you can do a lot of stuff with it. It's just I don't know why it has Harmony because all the relics have the relic tag, right? Which means that you're not triggering Harmony with them. So not too sure about that one. But I think there's added harmony for maybe lore-wise reasons, and that uh, overall I think you're just going to make a relic deck with this. But it's certainly an interesting card. Let's move on to the next one here, which is Dana Provider. So she's a relic combo with the other one, and she's a 7 for 14. So I have a feeling all these new cards are going to be very high power vision and high, very high power level, but we'll see what they do. So we have Doomed Harmony. I've seen a couple of these, but not all of them, just to clarify. Well, I said I think there'll be high provisions. So, Doomed Harmony. At the end of your turn, boost all Scoitel units in your hand with the primary categories you don't control by one. One hand or deck, evolve after you win a round. Oh, I might not have pulled up the evolved version here. I'll grab the evolved version for a second. Hold on. All the other ones were both pictures on the same page, but this one wasn't, so I had to grab it. So, at the end of your turn, you boost all Scoitel units with the primary categories you don't control by one. Now, this is interesting because you can just not play anything from the category you want to keep in your hand you can't obviously you can't do that forever because you'll have to play one at some point but you can do something like say you have five elves and you just play the non-elves in your hand and you boost all the elves by five five times it's pretty good or by by one five times so you get plus five boosts that is very good On the other hand, you can just use this for like a hand buff deck. And say you're hand buffing, you have like nine diff or like five different categories, and each you're getting like a point or two, or a point each turn on a bunch of your cards for hand buff. So this is a very good hand buff card. Uh, this one synergizes much better with harmony than the last card we just saw, but I think you can do this with hand buff as well. 
Perhaps hand buff will finally be viable. We'll see. This is interesting, though. I, it seems pretty good. But then again, we also check out the evolving card. And keep in mind, these new evolving cards evolve when you win a round, not at the end of each round. So let's take a look at what she turns into real quick, which is the Caretaker. So she got the same stats. Deploy the boost the lowest power of e allied unit of each Scoia'tael primary category you control by two. Whenever you play a Scoia'tael unit of a category you don't control, boost it by two. So what you do is, in theory, it doesn't ma in theory it doesn't matter if you play this first or last because the units are getting plus two boost anyway. But if you play it last, you can't get locked. So say you have five different categories, you play this, it gets plus two and everything. It's a seventeen point play, and you've boosted with the hand buff already. Obviously, this card is kind of insane. It's a massive value on it. It is a 14 provision unit. We kind of expect 14 provision units to be ridiculous, and this certainly is. So, as a lot of points, you basically hand buff your hand buff your cards, and then once they're bigger, you play them, and then you slam Dana, and she makes them even bigger, and it's a really big finisher, or just an engine for round three. You play her first when you play the cards to get plus two boosts, you can protect stuff. Very very good. Now on to Skoy, or not Skoytel, finishing Skoytel, we go on to Skellige. We have Svalblood here. He's a 10 4 13. He's a big boy. And he's a beast. Deploy damage all units by one. Okay, that combos really well with his cards. Whenever a bear abomination enters your side of the battlefield, repeat the deploy. So with the Ursine Ritual, you can trigger this at will. So you can play the deploy, play this, damage everything by one. You can do Earth Sign Ritual, spawn another bear abomination, damaging everything by one. And then the first time you deal six damage to units each turn, spawns Fall Blood Fanatic on this row. Okay, so this is an absolutely ridiculous engine. If you're playing a self wound, which is good. Self wound kind of's been it's kind of been pushed off to the side of Love Skelga decks, and you don't really see it anymore. So this is a very good way, and it makes sense because it's Fall Blood, right? It makes sense. And it's a very good way to combo that with him because what you do is you're you're doing six damage each turn ideally because you're making bear abominations and i'm pretty sure this triggers on his deploy so you deploy damage all units by one and you get the fanatic and then you can hit the fanatic with the bear abomination and then you can repeat the deploy but you won't get another fanatic so you want to time this out it's a very good engine but you have to do it like it's once a turn ideally but remember you can make bear abominations off of what you can do it on arnvold i think that's his name the one who turns one into one off of primal savagery and off of the Earth Sign Leader Ritual. And, oh, I think there's another way, but I forgot what it is. Anyway, uh, you can do this a few times. You get a whole bunch of points. And you don't have to deal the six damage to one, to six damage to get a Fanatic with him. You can play, like, Offerings to the Sea, stuff like that. You can play uh, Yennefer, Venderberg, a whole bunch of ways to do this. It seems very good, and it's going to be a lot of fun to play around with. I think we might try this first, just because I really like Earth Sign Ritual. But, yeah, very good card, and... A nice way to tie together all of the Swell Blood Self Wound type cards. We'll definitely be trying this out. And it's really nice synergy because you're getting the Fanatic. The Fanatic's turning into the Bear Abomination after you damage it twice. So, although you do have other ways to make the Abominations, like I mentioned, like with the Primal Savageries and stuff, this will be the Fanatics will be transforming into Bear Abominations. That's what's cards they're getting. The, the Fanatic is right here. But yeah, they'll be transforming to Bear Abominations after two turns if you keep triggering the damage. So you keep getting more bear abominations, repeat the deploy, and it's a very, very potent setup here. Again, I think a lot of these new cards are like remove or lose type of cards, which I am not the biggest fan of, but we'll see how they're implemented. They are very expensive, so it's not the worst thing. Next up, we have Tyr, Slayer of Yngvar. So he is a 9 for 14, kind of huge. He's a human warrior. What do we have here? So we have Doom to deploy damage enemy by the difference between its base and current power. With Death Blow, gain resilience. And he's an evolving card, so it'll evolve when you win a round. There's two ways to use this. The first way, the opponent has a really big unit, and you hit it with the deploy, and it's essentially a reset. Right. You're damaging by the difference. So the opponent has a 4 and is boosted to a 20. You can hit it with tier, and it'll go back down to a 4. That's one way. You do not get the death blow then. The other way is they say they have like a four or an eight, whatever. It is damaged to half its power. You hit it with tier and it dies. And you get resilience. A nine with resilience is very, very good. Uh, but look at Siri or Shoop, for example. Shoop eight resilience is a 
good choice. And Siri's obviously ridiculous, but she has the deck building condition. So nine with resilience is good, but for 14 provisions, I think you usually want to be using the evolved form. And let's take a look at what that is. Master of Onskellig. So nine for 14 still. Deploy, move a bronze Skellige unit from your graveyard to your hand, and then discard a card. The first time a bronze unit enters your graveyard, each ally turn boost by its base power. Boost it by its base power. So what you do here is you move your bronze unit from your graveyard to your hand. So you take your, say, your great sword from your graveyard to your hand, and discard a card. So you can discard your discard fodder, and the bronze unit you move to your hand gets boosted by its base power. So you move the great sword from your graveyard to your hand; it goes from a ten to a twenty. It plays for 14 because of the self damage effect will still take place. So this is an insane engine if you're playing a graveyard centric deck with stuff like Freya's Blessings or even just like Fakusha's. Very good, but you have to build your deck around it once again. Kind of like this Fall Blood one. They're insane cards, but you need your deck built around them, which kind of is how these high version cards should be in my opinion. But yeah, so Tier has a couple good effects. I think the Master of Onskelleg, if you're using it, is better potential, but Throwing him down for resilience certainly isn't bad. I like the uh, flexibility there, where it looks like either of the forms isn't too bad to play. I think you'd rather use the on Skellig one. Moving on to Northern Realms, we have the Temple of Melitele, Congregation. So Doomed Immunity Resilience means you are not ever going to be able to remove this. I don't think there's a way in the game to remove this card. So deploy, it's a 12 version uh, location by the way, deploy, create a legendary unit from your faction that is not in your starting deck three times and shuffle them into your deck. So that's interesting. You're going to make a bunch of cards. It says it's creating and there's it's creating from the pool that's not in your deck. The pool is actually quite a bit smaller. So you have like six legendaries in your deck. And then you're creating from the from your faction, which limits it even more. And then you're seeing nine cards that aren't in your deck. Theoretically, nine. I guess you could see the same one twice if you don't choose it. But you should see most uh, a decent amount of the Nilfgaard legendaries when you do this. So, not Nilfgaard, uh, Northern Round legendaries. So that's very interesting. And then you put them in your deck. And it has order, draw a unit of your choice, and boost it by your hand size. And shuffle card back into your deck. So boosting by hand size, you're probably going to get like... If you play it early, you get like eight or seven on that boost. But I think you're going to hold off on that order. But the thing is to mention, you can just draw like your best card, like you can use this to draw Foltest, or you can use it to draw one of the good cards you put into your deck, or whatever you need, or even Melly Telly herself, which we'll get to in a minute, because I did see her before, and this synergizes quite well with her and the Griffin Witcher mentor changes, so yeah, this seems pretty good, and if it does evolve, you get this, the Temple of Melly Telly Pilgrimage, so still doomed to mini resilience, deploy, shuffle an allied unit back into your deck, then shuffle an enemy unit of the same power or less back into your opponent's deck, so essentially this is a removal for pretty much anything if you have a big card, which is good. <laughs> it's obviously really strong. The opponent can still play out of their deck, but it's round three, they're not going to. So it, And you can play something that's like a point slam type card. Say you just play like a bronze eight. I don't know. I don't think Nilfgaard has, or Northern Realms has one, but you just play like a bronze thing that's an eight, and then you shuffle their big engine card like the Svalblood or something back into their deck. Obviously, you'd have to have a 10 for Svalblood, but you know what I'm saying. And then you have order, play the shuffle unit from your deck. So you get to play whatever your card was. And since it's playing, you can redo the deploy effect. So there's a lot of synergy there. That you play a card twice. Uh, something they tried to get rid of a while ago, but we'll see is coming back here. So yeah, it just the order lets you play a card twice in one turn. We all know that's kind of insane. We'll see what we can do with this. There's obviously plenty of options. Um, Northern Realms has some decent deploy cards. You can replay it on Sace for double duel. If you've got boost from leader or something. So there's a lot of ways you could do this. And uh, yeah, I'm just like off the top of my head on Stace you can do. Like you play him, you shield wall him, duel, shuffle him back in your deck. Shuffle the opponent's card back in the deck. So you've dueled one card away. You shuffle another card away. You play on Stace again. You shield wall it again. You duel another card away, right? You can do stuff like that. So obviously there's a lot of potential of the pilgrimage here. And there's going to be a lot of combos using it. So we'll see here. And there's a good differential here. Like, if you want to get the Melitelli or something bigger, like Priestess, you can use the Order, the Unevolved. And then the Evolved one's a really good finisher. So, there's that. Now on for Melitelli herself. Deploy, boost an allied unit by 5. So, 8 for 14 when you play her. Once you just put back into your deck, trigger an ability of the cycle. Maiden, boost all allied units by 0. 
Mother, spawn a random 4 for your Northern Realm unit on an allied row. Crone, increase the other values by 1. Beginning of each round, restart the cycle. So, if you deploy her, um, when you deploy her, she's not great, right? You don't really want to be playing her unless you have a way to put her back into your deck, like the Temple. So, you don't usually want to be playing her, you just want to be getting these effects here. So, what you do is, you want to be cycling this, right? Each time you cycle it, the goat values go up by 1. So, if you do it 3 times, you get the Maiden Mother Crone, and the other values go up by 1. If you do it 3 times, you get a random 4 version Northern Realms unit. You do it six times, you get a plus one boost on all of your units, which is quite good, because they'll be later in the round then. And you'll get a five version Northern Realms unit. You do it nine times, like you did every turn for a round, which will be very difficult. You get all your units boosted by two and a six version Browns Northern Realms unit. So there are ways to do this. You have stuff like Snowdrop, you've got the Griffin with your mentors, you've got Pincer Maneuver. There's ways to do it. And it's like traveling priestess, but it has a much more interesting effect, in my opinion. At the end, that you just play it or whatever. So this seems like a very good effect because you're, it triggers when it goes in your deck. You don't have to actually use the card. So this is potentially very good. And I think it'll be a very fun one to play around with. Depends to see if it's like Traveling Priestess. If there's no interactivity with it. Well, the thing with it, it's not like there's no interactivity, right? Like she's putting cards to the board and giving boosts. It's not like it's an insane finisher you can't deal with. Because the finisher is just 8. But in a long round, it's got a bunch of value, which kind of makes sense with how I've always imagined North of Realms to be an engine-focused deck. But this will be an interesting one. Next up, we have Ardfen. So, 11 provision artifact. Resilience. Uh, does not say location on it, which is weird to me, but whatever. Order, look at the two top two cards from your deck and choose one to move to the bottom. If it was an agent, give an enemy unit spying. If it was an aristocrat, give an enemy unit bleeding too. When you play an aristocrat, refresh the order. While in deck, when you play a gold aristocrat, summon itself to your melee row. Okay, so it thins itself out of your deck when you play a gold aristocrat. That's really nice. And then if you play an aristocrat, you're giving an enemy bleeding and refreshing the order to look at the top two cards of your deck. I think this combo is extremely well with Aristocrats. If you use stuff like Thirsty Dames, when you do the order to give something bleeding, theoretically give it bleeding if you have enough Aristocrats in your deck, then you get a boost on Thirsty Dame. So that's nice. And you get a reset on it. So potentially this helps quite a bit with the Agents and the Aristocrats. Um, it works very... I would say this would work pretty well in the Spying Ball deck where you have the Seditious Aristocrats. Maybe you can even combo T-Bore with this now. It would look like it would be a good idea to do so. We'll see if we make a T-Bore deck with this. It seems really... It's it doesn't, it's doesn't. not as flashy as the other cards. And it's max potentials. Max potential is what? Two bleeding a turn, triggering a Thirsty Dames. But it does thin itself out of your deck, which is really good. And it does have resilience, so you can use it quite a bit. I think this card will be underrated quite a bit. But I don't, I don't know if it's as strong as the other cards, but I think it's better than it looks like on paper. So I think you can do some good stuff with this in a deck. We'll be trying this one out. Next up, we have Taurus Van Amris, the founder. 4 for 14. Doom deploy. Give spying to three units with version cost 10 or less from the opponent's deck and spawn base copies in your deck. Boost self by one for each vision under the limit. And then it has the order. Not a zeal order. Keep in mind, just an order. Vanish up to three cards from your starting deck. And then it will evolve. So, well, first of all, it lets you see every card in the opponent's deck. So if uh, there's two there's two aspects to this. If you don't really know what's going on, you know every card in the opponent's deck. Um, two, if you know every card in the opponent's deck because it's a meta deck, for example, you know it's a we'll just use like the last patch. Say you knew like a couple patches ago, you do every card in every every imprisonment rent free deck used to have every card being the same in it. Say you knew it was an imprisonment rent free deck, you knew all the cards in that deck. It doesn't say starting deck, so you'd see every card in their deck, and then you'd know every card in their hand. So if you know, if you have a good knowledge of what the meta is and they're playing a meta deck, you can probably tell every card in the opponent's hand, which means you know when you have to play around Heat Wave. Like you might, if you see a Heat Wave in their deck, oh, you don't have to play around that anymore. <laughs> uh, but I guess, actually, no, no, because this will only show you units, right? It'll, yeah, you see all the units in their deck. Sorry. So uh, you can do stuff like if you see an Igni in your deck, in their deck, like, oh, don't have to play around Igni, stuff like that. Really good knowledge, which is underrated by a lot of... Um, players I think and then you give spying to three of them and put copies into your deck so there's two three things you can do here or two things you can do here 
You can pick three bronze, four provision cards, and this plays for 22. Obviously, that's really good. You can just play this. You can just play this for a straight 22. Pick three, four provision bronzes. You can pick three 10 provision cards and increase the value of your deck by 18 provisions, right? Because you're going to banish three fours from your deck then. Or you can just do a combination, right? Like, see, oh, there's one gold. That card's really good. I'll put that in my deck. And then oh, I'll just banish two bronze, two bronzes. And then pick two bronzes and get, like, plus 12. This card's very good just in the base form and very flexible. Keep in mind, if you're picking the low provision cards, you definitely want to live to do this banish ability. So I think you probably wouldn't pick three fours because it would be a four and die. But I think you pick, like, three fours. Or no, if you pick three fours, it's going to live so you can banish it. You pick the high value ones, you won't get to banish it. So I think you probably want to pick like one low provision card to make sure this thing lives. But it's very, very good already. Now when it evolves, we get this effect of Doomed Assimilate. Deploy. Return an allied unit to your hand and give it Doomed. Excluding self, by the way. I would put the excluding self earlier in the sentence, but whatever. Then play a card. Does this sound familiar to anyone? This sounds like the old... A mere ability. It's really good. So what you do here is the opponent, if they play Trist Meteor Shower, not on the last say, oh look, there's going to be two Trist Meteor Showers. You purify Renfree. Oh look, there's two Renfrees. So obviously this has insane potential because for some reason we don't have Nilfgaard printed on the text here. It's not a Nilfgaard unit. I thought we figured out this should be limited to Nilfgaard units or in faction units like three years ago, but... It's going to be any unit. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of sketchy decks that will be able to do stuff with this, but uh, uh, we'll see. I I have a feeling this should have been limited to Nilfgaard cards, but you know what? Apparently not, so we'll see how this works. Obviously, this card's insane. I don't have to, like, I don't have to explain this to you guys. The, the base form is ridiculous by itself. It is 14, by the way, so the base form is kind of insane. <laughs> it can play for 22 on its own, <laughs> and then... Uh, yeah, it, or you can just make your deck full of really good golds and then banish some of your bronzes. So that's really good. And then you've got the High Priest, which is, just doubles. You're basically just going to double your finisher card most of the time. So, uh, yeah, this card's insane. Next up, we have Count Reuven's Treasure. So it's Resilience, 12 Provisions, Profit 0. Increase the profit by 1 for each crime in your starting deck. Two ways to do this. One, you have 9 crimes. So you always have a full thing. Two, you just have um, playing jackpot and you have like 12 crimes and you get an overkill on this. Um, some of these cards might want jackpot. We'll see. Deploy, create a bronze crime with provisions equal to or less than the excess coins gained. So if you're over profiting, you're going to turn it into a crime. Uh, bronze crime, so you can't make a second collusion or anything. And whenever you gain coins, gain counters equal to the excess coins gained at the end of your turn lower the counter by one and gain a coin so you're making like a second coin pouch right so if you have nine coins this profits you nine you have nine counters for nine turns you're getting a coin every turn at the end of your turn this can be really helpful it gives you another form of carryover with the coins sometimes you do over profit but um especially something like this it'll just use 12 crimes you could this could potentially just play this for like profit 12 say you're already at like four or five coins this could give you a coin per turn for the rest of the game so this one is very interesting, and you'll have to see how you play around with it. Um, it does combo well with In Search of Forgotten Treasure. So that's worth noting, because this you can put this ahead of the In Search of, In Search of Forgotten Treasure, and it'll help proc coin effects for the Gudrun and stuff at the end of the turn. So I think we'll be trying that out for sure, because I think that's the best use for this. Well, maybe not the best use, but I think it's the best way to make the tie Cloak stuff better. We'll see if this is good enough, because it has a very good potential there. Next up, we have St. Gregory, just a car. A 5 for 14, Doomed. He's a Cleric Firesworn, so this is the Firesworn card. Good to see Firesworn's getting a card. They definitely need it. Boost self by one for each unit you control. Gain a coin for each Firesworn card you control. Well, that's really good. If you're playing Firesworn, you probably have like 10 or 12 units. And then this is going to be a 17. That gives you like 12 coins. Um, yeah, this is really good. There's two two aspects to this that work super well with Fire Swarms. And I haven't read the Evolve form yet. This form, form by itself is really good. So you're going to have a lot of units with Fire Swarms. So it gives you a really big boost on itself. Two, Fire Swarms tend to not run that many coin generation cards, which they might want for the transform effects. 
and for the spawn effects. And this gives you coins, which is really helpful for Fire Sworn. So obviously this card's insane. And keep in mind, um, if you have a 10 power uh, guy, what's the card? Get its name. The one, the one that destroys and spawns. You can spawn this off of that if you destroy a 10. And uh, that's obviously very good too. And then we have the evolved form here, Doomed Insanity. Deploy damage and unit by number of Fire Sworn cards on this row. So probably just going to kill a unit, which is nice because Fire Sworn also lacks control. Look at this, guys. This is how you do it. You have a card. It solves a lot of the issues of the archetype instead of just buffing the cards in the archetype till the point ceilings are super high. Really nice. V2 damage enemy unit by one. Uh, that is super inefficient, though. V2 damage enemy by one. Now, you don't really want to ever want to use that. But then we have Berserk. Boost all. This is the first non Skellige Berserk, I believe. Boost all allied fire sworn units by one. Damage all enemy units by one. And destroy self. Okay, so I see what you're doing here. You use the V a couple times, and then it goes down to one. I guess you probably use the insanity for this too, because you don't want to waste coins here. You just do the ins you do the insanity effect. You don't want to pay this. You want to use coin. You want to use his health for this, not coins. So you do this. V two. You get two damage on an enemy, and then it dies with this effect here, because you can't you can't insanity if it would kill the unit. So you get this a berserk one effect instead. So you do two damage, boost all your fire swords by one, damage all enemies by one, and then he dies. So what you're gonna do here? is you're getting two points of damage from him and then you're going to boost say 12 units for 14 and damage eight units for 22 22 yeah this is pretty good i actually kind of like the first effect better on this guy but the second effect certainly good too if you have a full 18 units this is really good especially you're going to be wanting to make more copies of this i'm pretty sure because you make the base copy not the evolved version and you can make this if you have a 10 so i think you're going to be wanting to do that for sure card's really good. I'm glad to see Fire Sworn getting something it can use. Next up, we have Lilith's Omen. These are the monsters card. We saved them for last. So this is a 12 provision. Summon two monsters without veil from your deck, and then give them Rupture and Doomed. Alright, so there's a couple things here. This is an insane combo enabler. First of all. Um, so Rupture and Doomed. Doomed does not negate death wish so you can summon death wish cards and get their death wish just for something like um deadlock you won't come back but you can still just summon death wish cards and trigger the death wishes with this worth noting and because the rupture will kill the card so it triggers a death wish for you and the other thing here is you can summon stuff with armor or that have been boosted so let's take a look at these three situations here um, one, you summon stuff with Death Wish. Um, the most obvious thing here, or what they take a damage effect, the, you can do a huge point slam for one. If you summon out Old Spear Tip asleep because he's got two armor, it won't die to the rupture. And then it summons Old Spear Tip. So it gives you 12 points. And then you can do a, uh, what's his name? Penitent. will die and give you Pugo Boombreaker or Ghoulie. So that's like a 22 point tempo play if you do it that way. It does eat a lot of provisions out of your deck though. But it's also thinning your deck by two. So you can just thin your deck by two Death Wish cards if you want to. Because it's not random units. You get to pick the units. So that's one way. You can do that uh, for Point Slam. You can also just thin your deck by two Death Wish Bronzes. Thinning by two is worth quite a bit. Um, another thing you can do here is if the cards have armor. So what's got armor? Uh, Mortnart has armor. Cave. Oh, Cave Troll. You can just summon Cave Troll and a um, Mortnart, for example. And then I'll keep the Mortnart alive in theory because they can't kill Cave Troll and Mortnart in the same turn. The Mortnart will only have 2 H, two health though. So you could just summon those out and then consume with Mortnart and get like plus 20 on it. That's interesting. Maybe you'll be able to use Self Eaters for that. That'd be kind of fun. I'll probably play around with that. Or you can just summon out um, Thung 7 boosted by All God, for example. All God and Offering. It makes sense with the Omen, right? You just, the Omen's coming. You boost the stuff on your deck. You summon them out because Rupture's base power. And then whatever you summon all your deck lives. Yeah, I think the thing here is you, big one's gonna be Cave Troll plus a combo card, or you're gonna do it with um, high points. So there's a lot of options for this, and they all seem good. So we'll see what this ends up getting played for. Well, last of all, we have Dagon Promise. So Dagon is uh, uh, hold on a second here. I have to get the uh, other versions of Dagon. All right, so back here. Found the other ones. We've got Dagon here. 
So we got Dagon here. He's got Doomed. He's a Relict. 8 for 14. Uh, and obviously, Dagon's going to be insane. The question is, how insane? So, we have Doomed, sure. Deploy. Infuse 5 units in your deck with Death Wish. Boost the lowest power allied unit by 2 and worship Dagon. And spawn Call of the Depths in your graveyard. Order. Consume a unit. Whenever you play a Death Wish unit, boost it by 1. Okay, so there's a couple things going on here. Dagon has like infinity text. So far, at least. I've seen the other ones. I pulled them up. I didn't read them, but they have a lot of text on them. So we have a few 5 units in your deck with Death Wish. You're adding 5 Death Wish cards to your deck. So that helps for triggering stuff. Um, it's adding 10 points to your deck if you consume them all, which is nice. And then they're triggering Worship Dagon. So you're going to want to play those out of the way. Maybe you will... Well, Lilith's Omen, Omen is obviously just a way to get those cards out of your deck. If you want to. And then it has an order to consume. Whatever. We've already played Death Wish Boosted by 1. That's kind of okay-ish. It's not really going to help that much. It's going to be like a point on most of the cards you play, which isn't bad. But it's not the most insane engine. But... Uh, it is a lot of value he's giving you to your deck. Mostly because of this spawn Call the Depths. Because we look at Call the Depths here. After Dagon's been worshipped four times, spawn Dagon promised on your melee run banner self. This is the thing. Because you're getting him twice. You're getting this guy twice. So you're going to summon You're going to play him once. He's going to infuse all the stuff in your deck. And then once you've worshipped him four times by consuming these guys, you get him again on your melee row. And then you have another 8 with a Consume. No Deploy effect, but you'll have the Engine effect and the Consume effect again. Which is definitely worth something. So that's nice. But if he evolves, you get Dagon Risen. And this guy has some text to him. Let's take a look. At the end of the turn, increase the counter by 1. So you have to wait 5 turns to get the full effect. And Death Wish trigger the abilities up to counter's value. So if he dies, you get these effects. As opposed to him being the Death Wish um, Consume card earlier. So, one effect, some lowest power bronze Death Wish unit from your graveyard to this row. Uh, this is fine. It like probably gives you four points. And then you trigger the Death Wish on it for like eight or something. They have boost all allied units on the row by one. You can also summon something from your graveyard like a Night Wraith or a Andrega Egg, although that card is not as great, and get some tokens so the boost targets more or hits more units that boosts like four or five cards it's already like eight value we've spawned storm on two rows in the opponent's row uh, that does quite a bit of damage and then four damage the two lowest power means by two that's not as great but it will help maybe kill something with storm and then you have five spawn a base copy of self in your hand which means you get another dagon promised uh, this, oops, let me click that tab. Uh, this is, there's so much to Dagon, and the ceiling is so high that he has to be ridiculous. That being said, he's super expensive, and you need to get him in your hand. You could always use Lilith's Omen, but then it's playing him, so. I think, uh, this, this is gonna be something of a card. We'll definitely see some Dagon decks. There's a lot, a lot of value on this last one here. And there is one thing I want to mention here, which I think this is potentially the most powerful part of his effect, is that he puts a base copy of self in your hand. That means you're gaining a plus one card advantage. Without, like, unconditionally, you're getting a plus one card advantage, and that card advantage is a 14 provision card. That's by far the strongest effect here. Keep in mind, he has to evolve for this, but this makes winning round one with all your stuff, except Dagon, and then just playing Dagon round two, it, it, it's an insane strategy, right? It's what you're going to do, like, every game with this guy. You want to play round one out, win it, you've won, you get this for round two, you play this round two, you get the base version back for round three, and, yeah, I think that's what you want to do. It gives you a crazy amount of points, and the extra card it just gives you every time you get to five counters and consume it. It's crazy. <laughs> it's really good. So we'll see here. The, the base copy part is the most insane thing on this. It's, I mean, you're getting, what, like four, then plus four from the Death Wish here. Probably like six here. That's 14. The Storm's probably doing eight damage, maybe six damage. 
That's like 20. We'll just say it's 6. That's 20 damage to 2 cards by 2. That's 24. You get the 8 points from him. That's 32. This thing potentially has like 32. Look at his number base copy in your hand. This thing potentially just gives you 40 points and puts a copy of itself into your hand. A copy of the promised version, not himself. So, this may be the new Renfrey, where it's the strongest card in the game just for points land. But we'll see. You have to evolve it first, remember. You get to deal with the promise. Maybe we see more combis. But this, you have to trigger the Death Wish. So, it's going to be an overwhelming hunger deck. Keep that in mind. Um, or just have consume orders. But this thing is... Dagon's, <laughs> Dagon's crazy. We'll see how many people are playing Dagon. I bet it's going to be quite a bit. But anyway, guys, that's all the new cards. Let me know what you think. You excited to play them? Try them out. And uh, we'll see you guys when the patch comes out tomorrow, probably with a new deck. That'll be it for this one, guys. Hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next time. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. And you can check out some more videos over here. And thanks for watching.